brought that on for me. Take your Bibles and open to the book of Matthew, chapter 9. Matthew, chapter 9. We're going to be in verses 35 through 38. Matthew, chapter 9, verses 39, 35 through 38. <coughs> You've got it. Look this way. It's time to meet with God. Are you ready? Are you ready? I pray you. I pray that you are. I pray that I am. I want to meet with God. I need to meet with God. We all need to meet with God. I pray that he does something in our hearts and lives this morning. Let's read God's word. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. But the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would meet with us, that our hearts will be open to receive you. God, I pray that you teach us through your word. I pray, God, that this would be of you, from you, for us. I pray, God, that we would do something different today and just let go. And let you have our, your will in our lives. I pray this in your name. Amen. I think Friday was a day of prayer. A day of prayer. And as I'm driving down the road, I'm listening on the radio to uh, the meeting they're having in the White House there. And I'm so thankful that at least, you know, we may not agree with everything that goes on, but I appreciated the recognition of a day of prayer. And I'm listening to the different prayers as I drove and, and what have you. And, you know, I got to thinking of the prayers in God's word and I got to thinking of the mighty prayers that we've heard uh, from people just within our services. Uh, listen as Don prayed this morning and he prayed very strong prayer and I appreciate that so much. Recently, I was reading and I saw a one-sentence prayer. And I think this is pretty powerful. It says, Lord, do things we're not used to. Lord, do things we're not used to. It's uh, definitely, it could be a dangerous prayer because if God ever truly begins to do things that we're not used to, the world as we know it will be turned upside down. We're very comfortable in our ways. We're very comfortable praying our prayers of God, lead me, direct me, protect me, these things. But how many of us would dare say to God, Lord, do things that I'm not used to in my life. Do things that I'm not used to. You know, Jesus specialized in making people uncomfortable. He told the rich run, young ruler to sell all that he had and give to the poor. The God of the Bible is not the God of status quo. And that's what we have, Christians of status quo. We're just going along and it's just, keep it the same, keep it the same. Don't change my life, Lord, just keep it the same. Things are going pretty well here. Status quo, status quo. He's not that way. That's not God's method. When God wanted to change the world, he told Noah, do something he'd never done before, go out and build an ark. for the rain that he had never seen. When God wanted to bring forth a great nation, he called a successful middle-aged businessman named Abram and said, go into the land, I'll show you. When God wanted to deliver his people, he found a man, I think much like me, slow of speech. I get tongue-tied, I twist my words up. He named Moses and sent him to talk to, the, to Pharaoh. 
When the Lord needed someone to hide spies in Jericho, he found the harlot, Rahab. When God needed someone to defeat Goliath, he found this young shepherd boy named David. When God wanted some men in his inner circle, he chose fishermen, tax collectors, kind of a loudmouthed guy named Peter, and a couple of boys known by the name, uh, known by Sons of Thunder in his group. To talk about doing things you're not used to. What a group he brought together. It's not the God of the status quo. You know, no one wants change. And yet, everyone wants progress. Isn't that amazing? I like the way things are going, but it'd sure be nice if my boss would give me about a, a $500 raise a month. You know? But no one wants change. That's the problem that faces every church in America. We're happy and we're satisfied with how things are going in our life, but we're afraid to pray the prayer. Make something different. Why? Change does this. Change pushes us out of our comfort zone. Change forces us to get out of the, the traces we talked about this morning, the ruts uh, that the wagons used to make that would, that would guide people to go to one place to another that they had never been before. And it, but it forces us out of our ruts. It changes us, upsets our routine. It challenges our priorities. Change disrupts our plans. You know, I've got things kind of going smoothly now, and I dare not pray God do something different in my life because he might just do that. He might just turn it all upside down. We bought a ranch. It sounds like it's something. It's really not that big a deal. It's going to be the place we retired. We're trying to figure out how to get moved down here. <laughs> We've got to sell the property. Je I remember we listened to a message years ago. A guy came into our one of our uh, 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 chapel services at the Bible College, and he said, I had my life all planned out, and it was to serve God in a particular way. And he said, God tore up my script. God tore it up, and he changed what I was going to do to something he wanted me to do. Change stretches us in ways that we don't want to be stretched. It'll kick us out of the recliner. It rearranges our daily schedule. If you want what you've never had, you've got to do what you've never done. What do you desire to have and or do for God in this life, the time that you have left? What do you desire to do? Aspire to do. What does he want you to do? Well, guess what? You've got to do something you've never done before if you're going to see that happen. I've been told that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for different results, you know? Sometimes God look, looks down from heaven and says, it's time for a change. It's time to change. It's time for a change. Do you trust your God? Jesus said unto them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, so send I you. John 20, 21. That's our standing orders. Go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. Mikiro Baptist Church, are we doing that? Are we doing that? Mikiro Baptist member, are you doing that? What are you doing to see that accomplished? See, we... Uh, the world's going to be changed, then the church must be changed. And if the church is going to be changed, then we must be changed, then the church. It starts with you. It starts with you. We desperately need to be shaken out of our complacency. We're so complacent. We need to, be, we need to move away from our materialism. We need to wake out of our slumber. We need to be convicted of our indifference. Oh my, right there. We need to be convicted of our indifference. The world's going to hell. And we say that we desire that, would, that that would not be. And yet, 
our life says, oh well. We need to be shocked out of our lethargy that we might become what God wants us to be. Certain steps must take place if God is going to do things that we're not used to. And it's got to happen to you, and it's got to happen to me. Here in the text, it's familiar to most this morning. In chapters 5 through 7, it talked about the principles of his kingdom and the Sermon on the Mount. And in verse 8 and 9, he displays his power. He cleansed the leper, heals the centurion's son, heals Peter's mother-in-law, calms the sea, casts demons into swine, heals a paralytic, heals a woman, raises the dead, gives sight to the blind, gives speech to a man that's mute, showing that he is God. And that's the background coming up to this verse 35. Everywhere he went, he healed people. Crowds flocked to him. And you go over to chapter 10, and he calls his disciples and sends them out. Something happened at the end of chapter 9 that turned the disciples from spectators, from spectators to missionaries. Something happened. And that's what I'm praying that will happen with us. It shakes us out of our lethargy. And we become a missionary. It's got to happen to us all. I see some things here. First thing, first thing I see is I see a, a neglected flock. A neglected flock. He said in verse 36, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. It all starts with seeing the crowds. Jesus saw the crowds. Jesus saw the crowds. You know, I'm pretty good at, at not seeing things. I've done this so many times, it's, it's not even funny. Alice will say, it's right there in the uh, kitchen cupboard. It's right there. Where? I don't see it. It's right there. Where? Third shelf, eye level. Right? I don't see it. She walks in. I didn't see it. How many times have you talked to someone and they said, Oh, well, this place, uh, it's right down and it's next to this store on, uh, on Olive. You've seen it. No, I've never seen it. I've never seen it. And what's happened, you may have driven that road time and maybe every day, never saw a certain business or a, an establishment or a repair shop. And then you go by looking for it and you go, oh, there it is. I see it. I see it. Jesus saw the multitudes. We don't see the multitudes. We don't see the multitudes. I don't like to be in crowds. You know? You ever been in a crowd and, and uh, you look around and you go, hmm, I don't see many people I know. I, can't, I don't see anybody I know, for a matter of fact. But we keep looking and then we find somebody. We find someone and we go, what do we do? We draw ourselves to them. Why? Because they're like us. They're like us. But that crowd, that kind of bothers me. We tend to, by nature, hang around people who look like us and act like us and talk like us. That's my people. I know them. But there's a crowd out there. There's a crowd out there. And we need to see the crowd. We need to see the multitude. It's more than just my salvation with God, my personal walk with him, just my family, my church body, we need to see the crowds. The world is full of people who are not like us. The first step is to see them. We need to see those people. He was moved with compassion. That word actually means to feel it in your bowels, down lower. I had a gut instinct. I just had a feeling and that was Jesus he was moved with compassion moved with compassion he was emotionally moved by what he saw and Christians we've lost our emotion you know I I would encourage you to sing when it's time to sing 
I just want to look out there and see you smiling and, and realizing that you're worshiping your God, my God. And it's different. We have no emotion. I think we, uh, and I think our churches are guilty of this a lot of times. We try to remove emotion. Well, let me tell you something. I got emotional when I got saved. Why? Because I realized that I was on my way to hell, and now I'm not. Praise God. He saved me. We need to take that same thought to the lost. They're on their way to hell. I want to see them become a child of God. See, he knew their true condition. Jesus said they were people like sheep without a shepherd. First they fainted. They were burdened and weary with various traditions and doctrines that were being taught them. No hope. Secondly, they're helpless. They're scattered abroad. They're all over the place. And they were in great danger of loss. Understand what Jesus is saying here. Here are the first steps. Seeing, feeling, and knowing. Until you see, you will not feel. Until you feel, you will not know. Until you know, you will not care. Until you care, you will not pray. Until you pray, you will not go. It's simple as that. The world's full of people who are wounded and bruised and mangled spiritually. They're bleeding and they're slowly dying without Christ. And here we sit. And here we sit. Secondly, Jesus mentioned a wasted harvest. He said in verse 37, 38, says, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. It's a key word there in verse 37. Then. Then. Then he saw. Then he felt. Then he knew. And he called his disciples to action. Kind of a surprising opportunity. The harvest truly is plenteous. You know, farmers know this more than us city slickers. I'm trying to be kind of a, I'm kind of a, I got one foot in a pair of coveralls trying to be a, a farmer type guy. I like that. Maybe one day we can have a church where we just wear coveralls, guys. That'd be kind of a cool thing, I think. Anyway, I digress. I digress. You know, harvest time is what it's all about if you're a farmer. That's the goal of the whole season. You've gone out there, you've worked the fields, whatever your crop is, and you try to get it to the point where it's time for the harvest. Everything that the farmer does, he does for that harvest. But the harvest do not last forever. There will come a time when God will call us out of this world. Harvest time will be over. You know, I never picked cotton. My mom and dad picked cotton. And uh, you have to pick cotton. Because if you don't pick the cotton, it'll rot. And it's no good. We need to be ready for the harvest. What did Jesus mean? He meant there were many people ready to be harvested for the kingdom. Here they are. It's white on the harvest. Harvest time. Christian, are we harvesting? Are we going out and harvesting? People are all around us, broken and bleeding. What's the problem? I think a lot of times the problem, we become so inward focused on ourselves that we cannot be, do outwardly. I just, I got this problem. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't deal with it now. I've got my own problems. I can't deal with you. I can't mess with you. I've got my own problems. We may not say that out loud, but our actions, that's what they're saying. You know, Christians are just sinners saved by God's grace, not perfect, but can do the work of the perfect father, if we will. They're ready to be reached if someone would only go into the field and harvest them. Will you go this morning? Fields are white in the harvest. Lost people all around. 
So where are the harvest fields today? It's all around you. You're there at a point in the middle, just draw a circle. There's your world. You're harvesting right there. That's where you harvest. Those people that God had put in your life. Jesus made an observation. He said the laborers are few. Harvest work demands harvest workers. So why are there so few laborers? Why are there so few laborers? Work in the field is not glamorous work. I worked in the field. Alice has worked in the field. It's hard work. It's not glamorous. You know, it's not where you maybe put on a tie and go to work and, and uh, you're a professional. That might be kind of glamorous. Working in the fields is not glamorous. But folks, we need to be in the field. We need to be working the harvest. If we're going to become laborers in the harvest, we're going to have to rearrange our priority. That's what it's going to take. We're going to have to change something. Some questions we should ask at this point. To you personally, what vision is God birthing in your heart? People come here to the McKee Road Baptist Church and say, what has God put in your heart to do? Why do you do that? Because if God has put it in your heart, we need to cultivate that. We need to see what God will do. We can put together all sorts of programs and activities and things that you can be a part of. But you need to have something that God has put in your heart. When you die, how will you be remembered? Well, what do they say? Well, that's a good old boy. You know, always had a smile on his face and laugh, you know. But what did he do for the Lord as you think in your own mind? And I guess, and how much are you willing to invest of your life? You know, time is precious to me. Time is precious to me. I have to watch. That's an area in my life that I have to not be greedy with. Others, it's maybe money. Whatever it is, you need to invest your life. And then Jesus said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. The church's primary re response to the needs of the world can be summed up in one word, pray. Pray. The church is to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Perhaps we're not praying that enough. You know, where are our teenagers that used to be coming forward and I'm surrendered my life the mission field. Even married couples come forward. I've surrendered my life to God's full-time service. I'm not saying that like I used to see that. It bothers me. The fields are white under harvest. We pray to the Lord of the harvest because all things are by him and through him and from him and for him. He knows where the seeds are planted. He knows when harvest time has come. You know, sometimes we'll think, oh, it's just coincidence. I'm reminded of the story of Brother Scheidbach driving. And, and, and a personal note, he was talk, preaching this in a, in a message. And he said, I was at battles. I was at odds with the Holy Spirit. And he said, I got my heart right with God. And he's the type of guy who becomes totally consumed of what he's doing. And he was consumed by the moment. And he said, where am I at? He was going to a preacher's meeting. He pulled off, came right down into a gas station, and he said, uh, young man, do you know where this place is at? And he said, yes. He said, is that the preacher's meeting? He, yes. He said, how do you know about that? He said, well, somebody stopped by, and he handed me a track. He didn't call it a track. He said, this piece of paper. And he said, I wonder if you could take, tell me what this is. And he was able to lead him to the Lord. It was time for harvest. It was time for harvest. Now, he could have been like a lot of preachers, a lot of people and say, you know, I'm late already. I'll, I'll come back. It was time to harvest. We need to be ready to harvest. How are we to pray? Send forth laborers. This is interesting to me. Underlying Greek word conveys a very powerful image. It's called ekbalo. The ek part means out. It means out. And the bolo part means to throw, like throwing a ball. So I can relate to this. Ekbalo. It means to out, to throw. It gives us our English word ballistic. 
and it refers to the explosion that happens when the hammer of the gun or the pistol strikes and it hits the bullet and it propels it out of the gun, propels it out of the gun, ekbalo. This is what he's saying. We are to pray that God will light a fire inside our church that will ignite a movement inside the hearts of many that will result in people being thrust out of the church and into the fields of the world. I think that's very neat. Ekbalo. We need to pray that God will throw some people out of the church. Baptists are pretty good at lettering people out. It used to be down in the south especially. You get in those churches and, oh, that person's no good. You got to go. And that person's no good. They got to go. And they would vote on them. Eh, you got to go. What he's talking about here is people getting a heart's desire, a burden from God to be out and harvesting. And so we need to pray that God would throw people out of our church, would throw people out of our church. Lord, throw them all the way to Egypt. Lord, throw them all the way to Venezuela. Lord, throw them, you fill in the blank. Blast them out to the corners of the world. Hudson Taylor spoke about the additional need for workers on the field. He said, the great need is not for more elaborate pleas for help. If we are to meet the needs of the world, two things must happen. First, there must be an earnest prayer to the Lord of the harvest. And secondly, there must be a deepening of the spiritual life of the church so that men will be able to stay home. We must pray and deepen our own walk with God this morning so that when God calls us, we will be, we will care more than we think it's wise. We will risk more than we think it's safe. We will dream more than some think it's practical. That we will expect more than some that think it's possible. We've just taken the miracle working of God out of our churches. It's good when Christians get interested in prayer. It means harvest time is coming. It means God's getting ready to move his people. Your heart's stirred up. It's a sign that God is working in your life. When's the last time your heart was stirred by the things of God? When's the last time that you actually felt that God was stirring your heart? It should happen in today's service. We're meeting with God. God should be stirring your heart. He's stirring mine. If he's not stirring your heart, why? When God stirs, he's getting ready to do something. And that's when we go, God, what is your will? Let me get right in the middle of it. Brings me back to the one sentence prayer. Lord, do things we're not used to. Are you willing to pray that prayer this morning? I would urge each and every one of us, pray that prayer. Pray it this week. Pray it every day. Lord, do something. Do things that I'm not used to. Don't be afraid. We serve a God of grace. He's not going to cheat you. He loves you. He won't take advantage of you. Lord, do things we're not used to. Something's got to change. Let's pray.